just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. It's, it's a way of life. It's not just a good idea. It's not just, it's not just a, a catchy phrase that we see scattered throughout the scriptures in the Old and New Testament. It, is, it really is a way of life.
lift up your praise to him this morning. Uh, today we're continuing our movement through the New Testament. We arrive in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is known by a lot of different uh, names and descriptions. Uh, some refer to it as the better book because there's a great comparison about uh, the difference between the law and Jesus. And there is a resounding message about how Jesus is a better way, how his sacrifice once and for all covers our sinfulness. But perhaps most of all, Hebrews is, is known as a book about faith. Uh, the, the chapter that we know is the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. It's sort of like a hall of fame of people of faith uh, that have trusted in God and followed God. So I want to talk to you today and next Sunday about understanding the way of faith, about understanding some things about what it means to uh, walk by faith, to live by faith. And as a, a, a passage of, of reference, I want to look at chapter 10, which, of course, leads into uh, the Hall of Fame chapter on faith, chapter 11. Two, two places in Hebrews 10. I'll begin by reading a couple of verses, 38 and 39, and then I'm going to back up and read verses 19 through 25. But as you find your way to those verses, I want to, I want to say a couple of things about faith. Today, in the, in the message, I want to talk about how, how faith may be more tangible than we think. Sometimes we think of faith only in terms of something that is mysterious or ethereal or just out there, and we lose track of the tangible aspects of faith. Uh, we think of faith always as just sort of a blind leap or a step out into the great unknown. But there are some tangible, concrete substantial aspects of faith that Hebrews 10 teaches us about. And I want to talk a little bit about that because these things undergird our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think, in fact, that there are some dangers of having a faith that lacks substance. There are some dangers of, of having a faith that, that lacks some of these tangible expressions that Hebrews 10 teaches us about. And I want to discuss those. There has to be a connection with the way we live. There is a practical side to the life of faith uh, that is quite clear in these passages. So take a look with me, and uh, we'll talk about some of those. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. It begins with a quote from the Old Testament. It's one of the, one of the most notable quotes in all the Bible that we find, Old Testament and New and it is found right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 again. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The just shall live by faith. Beginning with that verse, it's hard to overestimate the importance of faith, the, the importance of faith as a follower of Jesus and as a, a believer in, in his lordship. Now let's go to verses 19 through 20. Back up just a few verses, and it begins, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love, and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to just say a few words about the imagery used by the writer of Hebrews in this passage in particular. As you read through this, there, the language used here to discuss and to describe faith 
it draws back to the image of the tabernacle. It takes us back in time to the tabernacle. And in those days, that early understanding that there was a, there was a veil, or think in terms of a curtain moving forward to the temple as well, this veil or this curtain separated the people from the presence of God in the holiest place. This veil was a veil of separation. It was a veil that kept them out. And only the high priest was allowed to go in around the Easter season and our celebration of the, the crucifixion of Jesus, his burial and resurrection. We talk about the veil during that season a lot of times because when Jesus died upon the cross, the gospel account tells us that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, symbolizing that the way was opened for us to the presence of God. The writer of Hebrews takes that a little bit further, and he tells us that it is the veil is the flesh of Jesus Christ. In other words, it was by his sacrifice on the cross, the tearing of his own flesh as he died on the cross, that sacrifice made a way for us to enter into the presence of God. Before we were restricted, before people were separated, before they weren't able to pass through that barrier. But Jesus, his flesh, the writer of Hebrews says, when he went to the cross and when he was crucified and when he suffered for us, he was making a way for us to come into the presence of God. Jesus opened this way for us into the presence of God. Similarly, in the Old Testament, we begin to learn that the high priest, the high priest had a role and a, and a responsibility to build a bridge from the people to God. And so the high priest would serve. The high priest was allowed to enter into the presence of God on behalf of the people as a, a mediator, a representative to go to the people. And now Jesus has become our high priest. His sacrifice, his suffering tore the veil and he becomes our high priest. And in doing so, also notice where it refers to the need of the high priest. As we go through the Old Testament requirements, they would have to be sprinkled with blood. They would go through washing after washing all of this in order to cleanse them, to purify them, to prepare them. To be able to go into the presence of God, there were these cleansings they would go through. A part of it entailed sprinkling of blood to cover their sins so that they could enter into the presence of God, the holiness of God. Now, what the writer of Hebrews tells us is those kinds of cleansings and those kinds of, of sacrifices and the blood that was shed in the past repeatedly over and over again is not necessary now. It's not necessary because of the sacrifice of Jesus once and for all. The veil, the body, his flesh that was sacrificed on the cross prepares us. And as a result of that, Jesus once and for all made a way for us to enter into the presence of God. That's what this passage describes for us. Now, what does that have to do with, with our faith? What does it have to do with our understanding of faith? I said that there's some substance to, to faith. There is some, there's a, a tangible nature to faith that sometimes we overlook. I want to say four things about that today. I want, to, I want to give you four things to take home with you in terms of your faith. Maybe think in more tangible terms. The first thing that I would say is remembering that faith is directional. Faith is directional. Here's what I mean by that. Faith is about movement toward God. Understand that Jesus gave his life. Jesus suffered on the cross, not in vain, but Jesus did all this using the illustration of Hebrews 10 so that we could walk into the presence of God. Formerly it was restricted. Formerly the veil, the curtain was there. Formerly there was separation. Formerly we couldn't go into the presence of God in the same way. But now... Faith is directional. There is movement to faith. And that movement, first and foremost, is a movement toward God. Listen to what it says. Let us draw near to God. 
Let us draw near to God. Sometimes we hear that and we just think in terms of, I need to draw closer to God. I should live closer to God. I should have a closer relationship with God. I want to I back you up from that point to make an even more important point, and that is let us appreciate the fact that Jesus died so that we can draw near to God. Let us never lose a, a heart of gratitude, a heart of thanksgiving, because Jesus died. His flesh became that veil that was torn for us so that we could walk into the presence of a holy God. Because without Jesus, we can't. Without Jesus, we can't. But now, the writer of Hebrews says, let us draw near. Let us draw near. It's movement. Faith is about movement. Faith is about drawing near. Faith is about access. Faith is about, it's, it's directional. When you think of your faith, always think of its directional movement toward God. Drawing near to God because Jesus made the way. The other thing about faith being directional that I would say is it's, it's forward-looking. It's looking forward. Notice the contrast in that earlier passage where it says, if anyone draws back, but we are not as those who draw back. No, we are those who draw near to God. Once the access has been granted, once we recognize and appreciate Jesus has made a way for us to come near to a holy God, it's directional. Look toward God. Lean in toward God. Move forward toward God. Faith is directional. The substance of our faith is, is in that, that current and that initiative and that flow and that desire and that passion. I want to draw near in the presence of God. Jesus has made that possible. Faith is directional. The second thing that I would say is that, that faith is it, it feeds and it fuels a commitment. It, it feeds and it fuels a binding together of our lives and our existence with God. As you read those passages, it says, let us hold fast. Hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast. If, if you will, when you think of faith, I'd love for you to think of tightening your grip. It's a great illustration of faith. I would love for you to think of tightening your grip on your confession of hope. My hope, as the old hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. Faith, it fuels, it feeds our commitment, our grip on our confession of hope, our trust in God, our confession that our hope is in Jesus Christ. It's in Him, our, our Lord, our Savior. It feeds that kind of commitment. We hold on to it. And notice these strong admonitions. Let us. Let us. Do you hear that, that togetherness in that passage? The truth is, is that there were dangers involved. The writer of Hebrews is writing because there were some danger involved during that period of time. There were dangers as it relates to the direction of faith because he's warning them, don't pull back, let us draw near. Persecution was looming. Difficulty was looming. Challenges to faith were looming. They were real. They were frightened. They were considering whether to continue to press on in their relationship, their newfound relationship with God in Jesus Christ. They were instead considering going back. Should we withdraw from the gospel? Should we turn back to the law? Should we go back to the old way because there are dangers involved in trusting and following Jesus Christ? And no, this faith is directional. It moves us toward God, drawing near to Him. And it also, it fuels our commitment that we will hold fast with a tight grip our trust in Jesus Christ and our belief in Him and who He is. Third thing that I would say is that faith is relational. And that's implied in these repeated phrases, let us, let us. Faith is relational. It says let us consider one another. And, and, and specifically it says consider one another to, to stir up love, to stir up good works. 
Let us not forget to assemble ourselves together. You see how relational this, this faith is? See, faith, it's not just about, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I trust in Him and that's all there is to it. No, faith is about your relationship with one another. It's about your relationship to the person sitting next to you. It's real tangible. It's real, it's real stuff of life. Are you stirring the people around you in love? I've seen a lot of people stir up stuff with people, and it wasn't love. <laughs> you know, it's true. But what, what this passage teaches us is, is that our faith in Jesus Christ is a relational faith. And that faith in Jesus Christ causes us, we want to stir up. Actually, that Greek text, it, it, it almost goes into that uh, provocation. Let us provoke one another to good work. In other words... It's, it's real, real love that, that brings about action and, and response and connection. How do you provoke someone to love? A lot of times that involves repetitive love that just doesn't give up. Love that is, as Paul describes, patient and kind. And forgiving and not proud. Over time, that kind of love. Have you ever met people and, and, and you saw so much Christ in them, you think, I just, I just can't help sensing the love of God in that person. I just can't help feeling that that person is just so full of the love of God that it provokes me to be more like that. That it stirs me up to be more like that, to, to, to be loving and to show that. And also stir up good works. Do we as believers, as, as people of faith, do we bring out the best in others? Do we bring out the best in others? That's what we're supposed to do. That's what faith is about. Faith, again, is not just about trusting in Jesus. It's a translation. It, it fuels our commitment to Jesus, but then it translates into relationships that honor God so that we bring out the best in others around us. That's a part of faith. That's, it's, it's a way of life. Bringing out the best in those that are around us. A part of that brings us back around to why is it so important to get together? Why are we here this morning? Well, our faith causes us to, to love one another and to provoke others to, to love and to stir up one another for good works. But also there's a, a great admonition there, but not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, you're going to need it more and more and more and more as time goes on. Do we need to assemble ourselves together less or more today than we used to? More. Good answer. More committed to assemble ourselves together, not less. Why? Because there seems to be a sense by the writer here that as things get more challenging, as time goes on, it's going to be more important for you to connect with one another and encourage one another and love one another and bring out the best in one another. So don't forsake, don't separate yourself because real faith... Real faith, the kind that causes us to get a grip on our hope in Jesus Christ, our confession of who He is, our trust in Him, our, our, our commitment brings us back around to say it's a relational. It's relational with, with our, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, with one another. But it it's also brings us back to where we started, and that is if we want to really fulfill this mission of God with one another, we better continue to lean forward and draw near to God. We better continue to, to, to draw from God in order to be able to share with one another. That's where we get the passion and the love and the, the perspective of Christ is by drawing near to Him. You may look around and say, how can I love this person? How can I bring out the best? How can I believe the best? How can I stir them up? You just don't know how bad it is. Draw near to God. 
as I mentioned last week in Philemon, a part of following Christ is to be willing to see people as God sees them. It's, it's to be willing to treat people as God would have us treat them. We don't get that perspective until we get closer to God. I almost, I almost have a visual picture of God. If we get close to God, God can begin to whisper into our ear and say, you don't see this person the way I see this person. You don't know this person the way I know this person. You don't love this person the way I love this person. You see, I died for that person the same as I died for you. And oh, by the way, do we really need to review your history? Can I get real? There's a perspective changer. And so Paul would write, be tenderhearted, be, be forgiving, even as Christ has forgiven you. Now, God doesn't do that, but God could, if he chose, pull out the list and say, can we just review the last 3,000 sins that I've forgiven you of? Can, can we just go over? You remember. Have you ever had those aha moments when you're mad at somebody for being a certain way, and then all of a sudden you're that same way? That happens to me regularly when I'm driving. <laughs> Regular, I would go ahead and say at least weekly, maybe daily. <laughs> Look at that idiot, got his turn signal on. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Happens all the time. It's a great aha moment. It's a great aha moment. What kind of fool would drive on the wrong side of the road? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's supposed to be over here. Happens all the time. Why? Paul says, be tender hearted, loving, forgiving, even as Christ has forgiven you. There's no one right now listening to me preach this message that is without sin. No one that's without sin. Faith is relational. And a part of that relational nature is it's drawing near to God so God can help us to see more clearly, to love people the way God loves them to see them the way God sees them. But it's also then translating that perspective into relationships where we provoke one another to love and stir up good works among those people. And we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So let me go on. Faith, finally. The fourth thing I would say about faith. Faith is tangible because it's, it really is life-giving. It's a way of life. It should touch every area of our life. The, 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 the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. It's, it's a way of life. It's not just a good idea. It's not just, it's not just a, a catchy phrase that we see scattered throughout the scriptures in the Old and New Testament.